Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Assalamualaikum and very good days to everyone Okay, next we're going to look at on uh, topics regarding high voltage AC generators right? High voltage AC generators So, <coughs> generators we know uh, it's a part of uh, equipment that produce electrical powers uh, for, for the ships so. So, uh, what's the difference between high voltage generators and low voltage generators? Is there any significant difference? Okay, and then what, what would be the construction? Is there any difference in terms of construction, in terms of protection, in terms of uh, how uh, the most important part is how high voltage generator able to generate voltages higher than low voltage generators? This is the part that we're going to be discussed in this topic. Okay, so uh, for these uh, topics, I will be uh, using uh, references uh, from uh, uh, manual, ship manual. Uh, this is high voltage vessels, cerebral half. So we're going to look into details of high voltage generator used in these vessels. Other than that, we're going to be using uh, this Practical Marine Electrical Knowledge Book by Dennis T. Hall. And uh, for the rules, we're going to be referring to uh, Bureau Veritas, uh, Rules for Classification of Steel Ships, Part C, Machinery, Electricity and Automation, Automation and Fire Protection. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> A high voltage generator is a, is a generator that produces voltages more than 1000 volt. So in the first topic, we have discussed about the definition of high voltage on board ships. Okay. So uh, if you look back on the definition, it says it stated that uh, high voltage is where voltage is more than 1000 volt. And the voltage is generated and distributed at high voltage, meaning that your generator should be producing higher than 1000 volt and, and distribution to the switch port is also in uh, high voltage. Or you can also have a low voltage generator, okay, and then uh, it being transformed to high voltage uh, and distributed at high voltage. Okay, so uh, the purpose of a generator is to produce electrical power. So Okay, so this electrical power basically will be used to power up all our equipment, either high voltage or low voltage on board the ships. So, uh, I believe you have learned about low voltage generators in your uh, undergraduates or your cadet ships. Eh? Uh, <clears throat> so, what's the difference eh, between uh, what's the difference between low voltage generators and high voltage generators? This is the thing that we're going to be tackling first. Eh? Okay, is there any significant difference? Right. Okay, so let's look at on generator specs. Right? Generator specs between low voltage and high voltage generators. Okay, so uh, I will compare two generator specs, uh, high voltage and low voltage, uh, where for high voltage generator, I'll be using uh, generator specification used in uh, LNGC 3 bar half. So LNGC 3 bar half is a 6.6 .6 kV uh, systems uh, uh, and the vessel is electrical propulsion, it's an LNG vessel, similar to number 3 uh, where it is a still LNG vessel called LNGC Putri Mutiara Satu, but the system is low voltage, 440 volts using steam propulsion. So uh, this is the specs uh, for high voltage generators used in 3 bar half. Okay, so if you look at on the specs, the ratings or the output will be 12,222 kVA. So it's a high voltage generator producing 6.6 .6 kV. And uh, but the current is just slightly above 1000 ampere. Power factor 0 0.9. Frequency 60 Hz. Speed 514 RPM. Okay. Uh, other specs. Uh, such as uh, other spec which is uh, quite important that we going to be discussing uh, which is such as the weight and so the weight for this generator is 42 tons uh, the protection uh, is uh, IP44 right and uh, 
Application Standard IEC mm, Classification Society uh, is under Bureau Veritas Temperature Rise Stator and Roto uh, Class F right? Both Class F Insulation Class is also Class F Okay, next let's look at on uh, the slow voltage generators uh, from Putri Mutiara 1 So, for this generator So, it's a diesel generator, a brushless type the power produced is 3,625 kVA. Right? Uh, voltage is just 450. Current, 4,651 ampere. Okay, it's a three-phase generator with a frequency of 60 hertz, where the speed is 720 rpm. Okay, uh, enclosure is the same, IP44. Okay, and uh, in terms of weight, it is just uh, 15 tons. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if we summarize eh, uh, and compare, uh, we do a summarization comparison between these two generator spec, high voltage and low voltage generators. Okay, like what we have, we have here. So I have summarized it in terms of these types of rating. Uh, we have output, voltage, current, frequency, power factor, speed, insulating, insulation class, ingress protection, and weight. Right. So what we have here, right, the uh, high voltage generators. Uh, if we compare uh, to low voltage generator, produce power uh, 3.3 times higher, and right? 3.3 times higher. And of course, the voltage is high also, uh, where uh, high voltage generator produce 6.6 .6 kV compared to low voltage generators. And in terms of current, this generator produce only uh, 1,000 amperes of current compared to this low voltage generator, which is 4.6 times higher in terms of current. So this is where we get the advantages of using high voltage generators, where the current can be lowered right, to produce more power. Frequency are the same, 60 Hz. Power factors, for power factors is slightly higher for high voltage generator, which is running at 0 0.9. Okay. And uh, speed, uh, both generators here are diesel generators, and that's why uh, the speed for generators uh, driven by diesels normally uh, is lower than turbines. Uh, but uh, the high voltage generator is lower in terms of speed compared to these high vol uh, low voltage generators. Insulation class, the same. Both are class F. So what does class F means? Uh, we're going to be discussing in this uh, slides or in this uh, topic later. Ingress protection are also the same, IP44. And in terms of weight, okay, this generator produce, uh, the high voltage generator is uh, slightly higher in terms of weight compared to these low voltage generators. To understand in details about power that we produce in generators, we need to go back to the things that we, the things that we call power triangles. So in the specs, right, the power is given in apparent powers, which is in the unit of KVA. Okay, so from KVA uh, given in the specs and the power factors values given in the specs, we can basically calculate how much active powers in kilowatt and how much reactive powers in kilowatt produced by the generators. So to, to do the calculations, uh, uh, the formulas uh, re reflected to these three types of power is like what given here. To calculate for apparent powers, the formulas is square root of 3, voltage times current. Okay, so what does this L means? This is a line values for both voltage and current. So when you read the specs of generators, the voltage and the current is always given in line values. So, square root of 3 times with uh, 6.6 kV 
times width 1069 amperes, you will get the values given in the specs where the apparent power in KVA for high voltage generator is 12,222 KVA. This formula is also being used in the low voltage generators. So you just substitute the values, you're going to get uh, the apparent powers produced by the low voltage generators. To calculate for active powers, the formula is like what given here. So the formulas for active powers is just uh, the same formula give, uh, given or used in apparent powers with the additionals of plus, sorry, times cos theta. Cos theta is the power factor values of the generators. So solving this, you get a kilowatt values produced by the generators. And if you want to calculate for total reactive powers, right? So the formula here given in phase values, P phase, I phase, sin theta phase. Okay, or you can also uh, solve for Q, which is total reactive powers, by solving the triangles using Pythagoras theorems. So to get the Q, right, you need to solve uh, this formula with the P and S values is known. So, uh, how generators uh, produce voltage? And we, from the previous slides, we can see that to produce power, generator need to produce two main components, which is voltage times current. So firstly, let's see how voltage is being produced in the generators. So to produce voltage in generators, you need to have flux density P, you need to have lengths of conductors and speed, velocities of the movements. So flux densities can either be produced by permanent magnet or electromagnetism. So this is what we call a flux densities. L is the length of conductor that cut the flux densities with certain velocities or speed. If either one of these value is zero, the output voltage of a generator is zero. Meaning that if your generators are not rotating, which is the V zero, voltage will also be zero. If your flux density is zero, your voltage output will also be zero. So to produce higher voltages, we also need to play with these three values only. Either we increase the B, the L, or V. Or we can have combination of these values, we increase the combination of these values, or we can increase all the three. But the question is, which one is the most significant to produce higher voltages? Does we increase all the three? Combination? or only either one of these values. Right, to answer that, we have seen uh, the velocity, the V for both generators, high voltage and low voltage generators from the previous specifications. We see that the low voltage generators higher, have higher speed compared to the high voltage generators. So, one values can already be removed. Okay. So we left with these two values, the B, flux density, and the length of conductors. This slide will tell you either B is significant in producing higher voltages in high voltage generators. So if you look at on the excitation component, right? excitation 
component is the component that producing B. Okay, to produce B, right? B is the flux density produced at the main protos. Okay, to produce B, the voltage output from the generators, which is at the main status, AC voltage, will be supplied to AVR, where here the voltage going to be changed into DC voltage and supplying to excited status. The excited status will produce a flux density and that going to be cut by the excited rotors. At this part, output for excited rotor will be three-phase AC output, whereas this AC output then will be rectified by using these rotating rectifiers and producing a DC excitation current to the main rotors. So in this experiment, right, saturation curve test experiments, okay, the other supply from AVR is being disconnected and be replaced with the DC power supply, external DC power supply. So we will regulate the input to the excited status using this DC power supply and in terms of regulations right, we will increase the excitation current to the excited status right, from 0 to 2.7 amperes where increase by 0 0.1 amperes Right. We increase 0 0.1 amperes. So, by increasing, by regulating the current in the excitation, uh, excitations, by regulating the excitation current eh, to the excited stator here, we will get the V output at the main status. At the main status. Okay. So, firstly, uh, the excitation current is zero, meaning that not, no current supplied to the excited status. We can see that the V output will be 12 volts. This is due to the residual magnetism exists on each windings in the excitation systems. We start increase it to 0 0.1. We can see that the voltage increases to 55 volt AC. And once we increase it to 0 0.2 amperes, it increased to 92. Okay, so if you look at on the increase of voltage output from 0 to 1 amperes, we can see that a steady increase in voltage, which is around 40 volts. Okay, so once the excitation current is increased higher than 1 amperes. We can see that the output voltage produced is not going to be any more 40 volts. Examples between 1 to 1.1 amperes, the increase is just 7 volts. And then from 1 to 1.1 to 1.2, the increase of voltage is just 4 volts. Okay. So at this point, after one amperes of excitation current, after one amperes of excitation current, okay, it's not any more significant. The increase in voltage output is not any more really significant. So this shows that after one amperes, the B is already saturated. It's already saturated. So, uh, if either you, uh, <clears throat> if you increase B, uh, just for the purpose of producing higher voltages, it's not going to be working, sir. It's not going to increase the voltage more than, uh, it's not any more significant uh, in, in producing higher voltages by just regulating the B. So next slide shows that uh, this is from the specs regarding the speed 
of generator for low voltage and high voltage. So for low voltage generator, the speed is 720 RPM and high voltage, the speed is 514 RPM. So this is another factors that we can take up uh, from our formulas where speed is not significant in producing higher voltages. So we remove the B because of uh, B they have uh, what we call saturations and V from the spec itself it's not significant in producing higher voltages. So to produce higher voltages uh, in high voltage generators uh, we left with only one more component which is the length of conductors. So to produce higher voltages Basically, you should have more longer wires or more longer coils okay, used in high voltage generators. So if you remember uh, formulas or if you remember the principles of transformers, right, to step up voltage in transformers, we need to have more numbers of turn at the secondary coil. So similar also to generators, to produce higher voltages in generators, basically your windings at the status will be more numbers of turn. So that is the difference between high voltage generators and low voltage generators in terms of how to produce more voltage. So we're done with voltage, right? So to produce voltage, uh, like what given in the previous slides, okay, it depends on flux density, conductor length, and speed. If we, if we regulate one of these values, we are able to regulate our voltages. For current, right? Current. How to produce current in voltage? Uh, how to produce current in high voltage generators? Eh? Or how to produce current in generators? Current is just a flow of electron through a conductors. Okay. So when electron flows, they meet with resistance in whatever conductors they are flowing through. So the larger the conductor, the less resistance they met. Higher current, meaning that bigger conductors. So what does it mean? It means that if you want to produce higher power or higher current eh, in your generators, your winding size should be bigger. The cross-section areas of winding need to be bigger. So if we compare between EDG, emergency diesel generators, and main diesel generators, both in, high uh, in low voltage systems, you can see that both generators basically producing the same voltage. But high voltage uh, but main generator produce more powers. It is due to the size of the generator itself, where they use more thicker wires to produce more current. More current, same voltage, basically more power produced. Okay, so to produce current, okay, you need to have voltage and conductors with certain size, certain size. Okay. So basic generator construction. So a basic generator construction normally will have three main components. Firstly, the field excitation. The field excitation is the part that provides DC current to the rotor winding. Then we have our rotor fields, which are going to be producing the magnetic fields and rotated by a prime movers. And the third one, we have our stator winding or stator fields, which is used to cut the fields of the rotor and produce an AC output. So if you look at on the construction of generators that were given here, this is the excitation part right, and the main generator part. So the main 
generator part that consists of the main rotor and the main status and for exciter part you have the exciter status and the exciter armatures normally on the non-drive end is where your rotating diode is located now let's compare excitation systems for high voltage generators and low voltage generators this is the diagram that i believe everyone are familiar with okay, this is a low voltage excitation systems so excitation systems start from the output of the stator winding which is going to be your three-phase ac output then the voltage are being controlled and rectified at the AVR part, automatic voltage regulators, where the output here will be normally a DC current going to the exciter field. In the exciter fields, the fields, the magnetic fields produced here will be cut by the rotating AC exciters and producing three-phase AC output. This three-phase AC output then going to be rectified to DC by, by a three-phase diode bridge rectifiers before going to the proto windings. So this is an example of a low voltage excitation systems. What about high voltage excitation system? Is there any difference? So in this diagram, this is from a vessel Sri Amana. It's a 6.6 kV generators. And if you look at on this diagram, the excitation system looks similar with minimum difference. Okay, so this is the stator windings and the output of the stator winding is three phase current going to the AVR. Output of the AVR will be DC current going to the exciter fields. Here you have your exciter armatures where it will cut the exciter field windings and produce three phase AC output. A diode bridge rectifier then will change or will rectify the AC output into DC and going to the roto current or roto windings. So it looks similar. All the component in excitation system uh, for low voltage generator is present in the high voltage generator also. So the different thing is just this one transformers. Is being used to step down the 6.6 kV to 250 volt and supplying to the AVR. As we know, AVR is an electronic component which doesn't work in high voltage. So the voltage output from the status need to be right, need to be stepped down okay, from 6.6 kV to 250 volt to supply to the AVR. So this is an example of a low voltage excitation systems from a vessel called pronaspropane. So if you look at here, the same concepts or the same systems of excitation is used with the previous diagram. The output of the stator windings is going to the AVR and then output of the AVR will be going to the exciter fields. And then you have your exciter images, rotating rectifiers, and your generator fields. So up to this point, we can summarize that. So voltage generated in a generator basically depends on strength of magnetic flux, which is controlled by the excitation current and the speed of, uh, or rate of the flux cut the coils meaning that the speed of the generator, how fast your generator is rotating. Okay, in terms of frequencies for generator, it depends on rotational speed and numbers of pole. It is going to be based on this formula where frequency is equal to N, which is the speed, times with P, numbers of pole, divided by 120. So we can see that both generators either high voltage or low voltage are having the same frequencies of 60 Hertz.
for ingress protections, we have seen that both generators have the same IP numbers, which is 44. A bit about IP numbers or ingress protection. The first, the ingress protection basically tells you the protection for the enclosures of any electrical machineries. So for both generators, since the IP is 44, okay, the first digit basically represent the protection from solid objects. Higher the number, better the protection. And for second digit, is the protection from water. Higher the protection, better the, sorry, higher the number is better, better going to be the protection. So for both generator, which have high P44, we can see that the first digits four represent uh, protection from solid object, where here it says that uh, in any solid object more than one mm in size cannot penetrate to the enclosures. And for second digit, the four is protection from water. So the enclosures for this generator are protected against water splashing from any angles. So looking at the rules for IP numbers, like what given in the slides, so we can see that the IP numbers for motors, uh, this is the minimum required degrees of protection for, I, uh, for equipment, electrical equipment installed on board the ships. So uh, on the first uh, column here, we have condition of in location, examples of location, and then switch board, uh, control gear, motor status, generators, motor, transformer, lightings, heating appliances, cooking appliances, socket outlet, and uh, switching box, uh, switching or switches or connection box. So let's focus on the generators. Eh? So for generators, the minimum IP numbers here given is 22. Right? This is the minimum IP number required by class. For the class that we're talking about is actually Biro Veritas. Okay? So the X represent where uh, the X symbols represent equipment uh, which is not supposedly advised to install right? in terms of location. Okay, for generators, the IP22, uh, supposedly the generator need to be installed in the uh, area such as uh, engine and boiler room above floor, uh, in the steering gear room, emergency machinery room. Right? Uh, this is the three place where advice uh, uh, generator to be installed, basically inside the engine rooms. Okay, generator should not be installed in open decks, so that's why uh, a cross is given here. Next, uh, let's look at our insulation class. Okay, so from the specs that we've seen just now, both generators having the same insulation class, which is class F. Okay, class F. So from these tables, it tells us about the maximum allowable temperatures of various types of insulation. So since uh, both generators are having the same class, they have the maximum, the same maximum permissible temperatures of 155 degrees. So since uh, class are the same, it means that the, the running temperatures for both generators are basically almost the same. So you can check with your generators on board the ships, where you're going to see that the alarm limits for high temperature windings uh, got, uh, for either low voltage or high voltage is slightly the same around 80 to 90 degrees C. In terms of maintenance for generator, uh, the normal maintenance or one of the maintenance that normally being done on a generator will be insulation resistant measurements. So any parts of equipment, any parts uh, of component that made up a generators that have insulation around it are made up of insulation the insulation resistant measurement need to be done on the, on those part this include stator and rotor windings exciter windings bearing insulation space heater and pt100 detectors let's look at on 
insulation resistant for stator and rotor winding. So why we need to do IR test on this winding? The winding are subjected to electrical, mechanical and thermal stress. And throughout the years, the winding insulation will gradually age and deteriorate due to the stress. So the IR is a measurement that not only checks either your insulation is still good or not, it also can indicate either your equipment has excess humidity or two dirties in terms of insulation. So rules for classification of steel ships under Bureau Veritas is telling us about the minimum insulation resistance required for uh, any electrical equipment, right? And what will be the minimum test voltage that need to be injected. So if you look at on your low voltage generators, the rated voltage will be lies between here, 250 volt to 1000 volt where our low voltage generator normally will be at 440 volts. So for these types of voltage, the minimum test voltage that we need to inject using our IR tester is 500 volts. And the minimum insulation resistance accepted by class is 1 mega ohm. If you have 6.6 .6 kV generators, your rated voltage will lie between these values. So for these uh, types of high voltage generators, the minimum test voltage that need to inject is 1000 volt, where your minimum insulation resistance accepted by class is based on this formula, rated voltage divided with 1000 plus 1 mega ohm. For 6.6 .6 kV generators, the minimum insulation resistance accepted by class is 7.6 mega ohm. As uh, what we see in the previous table, right, generally uh, insulation resistance uh, for dry winding should exceed the minimum values as given in class significantly. Uh, definite, value, definite values uh, are impossible to give because resistance might vary depending on the machine type and local condition. In addition, insulation resistance affected by the age and usage of the machine. Therefore, the following values can only be considered as guideline. The insulation resistance limit which are given below are valid at 40 degrees C and when the test voltage has been applied for one minute or longer. So for roto, uh, if your insulation resistance is higher than 1.5 mega ohm, it shows that your insulation is good. But for status, we try to get a values which is higher than 1000 mega ohm for new status. And for use status, uh, values more than 100 mega ohm is sufficient. So if your values, if the values indicated here are not rich, the reason for low insulation resistant values need to be determined. A low insulation resistant value, which is higher than uh, minimum insulation resistant values, but lower than the uh, values recommended by the manufacturers, and normally often caused by excess humidity and dirt but the actual insulation is actually still good okay so for IR testing uh, that need to be done on high voltage generators the method is similar to low voltage uh, generators or low voltage machines right either between face to face or face to earth okay, it depends on the generator uh, construction and connection as well like what you see in here right uh, this is a generator which is in star connections where uh, if the star connection cannot be open so the connection of mega tester or IR tester that can be done is just between face to earth and for B here this is for Delta connected generators okay. for Delta connected generators if uh, the same you cannot remove or you cannot isolate the three windings. Uh, uh, if you cannot isolate the three windings uh, one by one, right? Basically, the connection that you can do to IR tester is between face to earth. And for C here, this is where you can connect. If you can open uh, the neutral connection of the generator, 
you can do between face-to-face -face connection. So for roto winding IR test, right? So for, for roto winding IR test, we need to be very careful on doing a roto winding IR test because uh, there's there will be diode yeah, in roto windings. So for roto winding IR test, make sure uh, uh, disconnect the brush from the slip ring of the earth fault detector is applicable. Uh, short circuit the rectifier before measuring. Ensure that the stator winding temperature values have been measured. They should be used as reference value for the roto winding temperatures. Connect the insulation resistor meter, uh, meter between roto winding and the shaft of the roto as shown. Okay, so the shaft should be the grounding point of your roto, not the body of your generators, because between roto and between roto and the body of your generators, eh, they are not connected directly connected. After the insulation resistance measurement, uh, discharge the winding by adding them. So when testing the stator winding of the excitation machine, disconnect the power supply cables from the voltage source, connect the insulation resistance meter as like what he shown in the previous uh, slides. So this is how you should connect uh, your insulation resistance tester to your roto windings. So you need to put a bypass wires uh, to the rectifiers and uh, the ground point should be the shaft of your generators. Now let's look at on the topics of generator protection. So generator is a very important component in our power distribution systems. So generator need to be protected from various kinds of fault. Okay. When fault occurred to any electrical machines, uh, such as generator, uh, it can threaten not only the equipment itself, it can also threaten personnel and the system integrity. Your system can be haywired when fault occurs. What kinds of fault that can occur? This is just an example of fault. In detail, we'll be looking at the latest regarding the rules and regulation, regarding what kinds of protection that need to be used to protect our generator from fault. An example of fault that need to be uh, uh, need to be isolated uh, or need to be rectified, right, such as overload, out of step out of step condition or loss of synchronism, uh, phase open condition, and short circuits. So this is uh, an example from uh, one of the vessels, uh, high voltage vessels that use uh, high voltage generators and what kinds of protection that be installed to protect the generators. It's like what you can see here, okay, the protection that be installed for this generator such as uh, three phase non-directional overcurrent protection, temperature sensors, under frequency and over frequency, under voltage, over voltage, earth fault directionals, three phase transformer in rush and motor startup current detector, stabilize three phase differential protection for generator, under excitation, reverse power and negative phase sequence. This is the typical uh, protection relay that we install to protect a high voltage generators. So normally a high voltage generators will have a grounding system that connected to NER. Due to that, they need to have an earth leakage release that uh, basically measure how much earth fault current that go back to the generators. Then we have this differential protection relay. Differential protection relay is used to protect generators from internal fault. And then we have this overcurrent inverse time, overcurrent instantaneous and negative phase sequence. Reverse power and that protect our generators from uh, motoring effect. Under frequency, over frequency, under voltage and over voltage protections that protect our generators from fluctuations of voltage and frequency. So when uh, 
when uh, system protection uh, for generators are being installed, there are some con consideration that need to be made. This is to ensure that uh, the, the protection that being installed are reliable and the protection that being installed should be selective. Okay, selective means it only isolate the faulty equipment so that the system is stable. Number three, the consideration should be the speed for a fault that uh, might able to damage the generator or the equipment, it need to be uh, isolated uh, in more faster time. In terms of simplicity, it should not be too difficult uh, to understand uh, how the protection system works. And number five, it should not be uh, too expensive to install. Okay, let's see some rules uh, regarding generator protection by BV. So this rule basically, uh, uh, this rule basically uh, can be used in both uh, low voltage and high voltage generators because it doesn't state either is uh, low voltage or high voltage. It's quite general where the protection for generators uh, is being uh, written to protect generators. Lah. So number, the first paragraph says that your generator need to be protected from overload protection. Uh, overload and overcurrent is the same thing. Okay, so overload protection need to be protect. Uh, overload protection, uh, overload protection is by circuit breakers. Okay, so when overload happen, your circuit breaker supposedly should trip. Uh, this is only true when your generator is uh, more than fifty kVA in terms of uh, power output. If your generator is less than fifty kA, fifty kVA. You can, instead of using circuit breaker, you can use a multiple switch with fuse on each faces. And the fuse uh, uh, for each faces uh, for generator which is less than 50 kVA, uh, the fuse rating should be at 110%. So if your generator is higher than 50 kVA, you must use circuit breaker to protect the generator from overload. And in terms of the setting, the breaker should be uh, trip when overload happen between 110% to 150%. Okay, for timing, the overload protection when uh, overload is more than 150%, the time delay not should not be more than two minutes. Other than that, uh, uh, the next protection that need to be installed in generators is short circuit protection. And when short circuit happen, uh, thumb rule says that the current will be 10 times than normal. So due to that, uh, this is quite severe uh, fault uh, if it occurred on the generators. So the time delay uh, for uh, protection to kick in when short circuit happen is less than one second. This is considered as instantaneous protection. The next protection that need to be installed in generator is what we call differential protection. Differential protection is required if your generator are ha uh, is having a capacity of more than 1500 kVA or above. So differential protection basically protects uh, generators from internal fault, right? internal fault that can happen such as uh, short of turn or a fault inside the generator itself. So the next protection that need to be installed in the generator is load shredding when overload. Okay. Load shredding is also, uh, this system is also uh, called preferential trips. So when excessive overload happen to the generator, to avoid the generator trip due to overloading, so uh, the load shredding system should disconnect automatically after appropriate time delay, uh, the circuit supplying the non-essential services to be disconnected. This is just to reduce the load for the generator and provide and uh, avoiding uh, overload uh, protection triggered then uh, blackout happen to the vessels. 
So next protection is about reverse power protection. For reverse power protection, the setting is based on the kinds of uh, prime movers installed in the uh, uh, prime movers for the generators. If your prime movers is a TA, turbo generators, the setting for reverse power is between 2 to 6%. And for diesel generators, the setting will be slightly higher, between 8 to 15%. And lastly, the protection uh, that need to install uh, for generators is under voltage protection. So when under voltage happen, the circuit breaker should treat is if voltage fall between 70 to 35% of rated voltage. Okay. And under voltage protection have two uh, main working methods. Eh? One is when voltage drops between 70 to 35 percent, it trips, or and, and then they have what we call an under voltage release. Under voltage release will prevent the closings of the circuit breaker if your voltage does not meet at least 85 percent of your rated voltage. So if your generator is running, uh, and the voltage is not yet reached 85%, you cannot close your circuit breaker because they have this under voltage release or in some word called under voltage inhibitors. Importance of protective relay testing. So protective relay need to be tested regularly to ensure that it is working uh, in satisfactory. Uh, without testing of protective relay, we doesn't know either our relay is uh, working satisfactory or not. We are afraid that when fault happen, if it's not working, the system might be jeopardized. So due to the critical role in the power system, protective relay should be accepted uh, should be acceptance test prior to be placed in service and predictably thereafter to ensure reliability, reliable performance. So in Codan industry application, predict testing need to be done at least every two years. But normally on board the ships, all our uh, all our protection relay will be tested in uh, during dry docks uh, by a testing engineers. What kinds of testing that protective relay need to be undergone. We have three types of testing. Number one is called acceptance test, commissioning test, and maintenance test. Okay, so what is acceptance test? So acceptance, acceptance test is also known as startup or commissioning test. Acceptance testing is performed on new equipment, usually soon after the installation and prior to energizing. So this test normally being done when the vessel is firstly being built and uh, the equipment are firstly being installed. Next will be routine maintenance test. So routine maintenance test need to be done uh, by our electrical engineers or ETO on board the ships to ensure that the equipment uh, or the protection relay works. Uh, uh, there will be uh, uh, there will be a predict times uh, that need to be uh, need, that, that need, this test need to be done. Eh? Okay, so um, next is special maintenance test. Eh? Special maintenance test need to be done when the equipment known to be defective or has been subjected to adverse condition. So special maintenance tests are used to verify its operating characteristic by attempting to re-energize. In example, an adverse condition might, uh, might be the fault interruption by circuit breaker which required inspection, maintenance and test before we need to place back the equipment into service. So, during, uh, normally during dry docks, uh, this is the test that being done by our uh, testing engineers okay, or protective relays engineers. Okay. Uh, in testing our protective relay. So normally the test that being done is what we call an, a current injection test. So the current is being injected directly to the relay and uh, to see uh, does the relay works based on the set standard that have been produced. 
So in terms of current injection test, there will be two types of tests. Uh, one is called primary current injection test. For primary current injection test, test current is being injected at primary site of the current transformer using primary current injection modules. So an example, a current transformer with ratios of 1000 ampere slash 5 ampere will produce uh, uh, the the, the primary current injector, injection test will inject 1000 amperes of current directly to the CT to see I, uh, either your protective relays will able to produce 5 amperes and 3. Uh, and secondly, secondary current injection test. So secondary current injection test will inject either 1 ampere or 5 ampere directly to relay. So this is more safer because they use smaller current compared to primary current injection test module. So how the test module looks like? Okay, for primary current injection test, uh, this is the module that they use. Basically, this module can produce very high current up to 1000 amperes of current. And this uh, test module is being injected uh, directly to the CT of your uh, protective release. And for secondary current injection test, the module will be smaller and uh, normally it inject only 1 amperes or 5 amperes of current directly to the relay by passing the current transformers and voltage transformers. Okay, so that's all for the topics of uh, generator protection. Uh, we have... Uh, to make you understand better, we have uh, produced uh, some videos to simulate uh, how protective relays in the generator or in a high voltage generator works. Right. We are talking about simulation in terms of overload, uh, simulation in terms of under voltage and over voltage, simulation for uh, preferential trips, reverse power and frequencies. Okay, uh, the next module will be uh, demonstrate to you all this, uh, all this function of protective relay that we install in the generators.